you need to look at the file search zero class. This is labeled zero cause, well, there's going to be multiple versions of this file search class. This class provides a file spec property indicating what you want to look for, a look in property indicating where you want to look, and a search subfolder property which indicates whether or not you want to search subfolders beneath the look in location. It has a non-default constructor allowing you to pass in various pieces of those three bits of information, file spec, look in, search subfolders, and it has execute and search methods. Executes a public method, it executes the search and returns back a list of all the values you found, and the search method is the one that actually performs the search looking through folders for matching file names. Let's stop and look at how the file search zero class works before we go much farther. I've loaded the sample project for this chapter named Delegates and Events, and I'd like to investigate file search zero. Within this, I have three public properties file spec, look in, search subfolders. I have a protected collection of files. This is a generic list of file info. Now you've seen the list class a little, we'll cover it in more detail later on. We'll use this files to keep track of what files we found. Down here we have a constructor which allows you to pass in look in, file spec, and whether you want to search subfolders or not, and it takes those values and places them in the class level properties. There is an execute method which returns a list of file info objects. It performs the search procedure, which looks for matching files, and returns the list of files that it found. It's the search procedure that does the actual work. Let's see how this works. The search procedure first creates a new directory info object corresponding to the path you specified, the look in location. Now it says if we're going to search subfolders, then for each directory in the list of directories we get, we want to call this procedure itself passing in the full name of that directory. So we recursively call this procedure, which will then continue to descend through subfolders till it finally loops through all the subfolders at the lowest level. At the lowest level, in the deepest subdirectory of your hard drive, once it runs out of folders to loop through, it now starts looking for files. It does that by creating here an array of file info objects, and it fills it by calling the getFiles method of the directory we're currently looking in. Passing in the file spec indicating what files to look for, it fills the array named local files with a list of all the files it finds in that folder. In addition, it adds the array to the list by calling the add range method of the list. Add range allows you to take an array of files and add them in one line of code to the list we're returning as our return value. Okay, there's also a little bit of exception handling because you might try to access a folder to which you don't have permission, and in that case, we want to just quietly get out of here. All right, that's the whole thing. That's file search zero. Let's try it. I'll choose option A, and here we're going to create a new instance of the file search zero class, passing in C colon backslash as the location, file spec star dot star, and false, we don't want to recurse into subfolders. Now here's the results. We're going to, here, execute our search procedure, return back our list of file info, and we're going to loop through all those things and display them in the output window. It's actually the console window, and there's the list of files we found. So what could be easier than that? That's our file search zero class that does exactly what we asked of it. It just returns back a list containing all of the matching files. So what if you need a slightly modified version? Your boss comes in and says, no, don't return a list of file info. Write the output somewhere. You could create a modified version with an overloaded search method. 
you could create a new class that handles the files that were found differently. File search one performs a different action. We basically just copied and pasted the class and performed a different action as it finds files. There's an alternative you could use inheritance. You could also create a class that simply inherits from the original and overrides the search procedure. File search 1A displays different information using an overridden search procedure. So let's look at these two alternatives. There's copy and paste, and there's inheritance as a way to create alternative versions of file search. Let's look at the file search 1 class. This one is just a copy and paste job. I made a copy of file search 0 pasted it in, changed its name to file search one and added one little bit of code right here. If the boss wants this class to display its own contents in the console window, I can do that. I just add code that in the middle of the search procedure adds that functionality. Okay, great. So if I run this now, here we go. I go to B and step in. We've created a file search one instance and we call its execute method. Nothing more than that. Hands off the keyboard, press F5 and go, and it displays a list of the files it found itself in the console window. Well, that copy and paste thing is kind of embarrassing, and you wouldn't want to do that in public. A better alternative, if you must go that route, is what File Search 1A does. It inherits from File Search 0. It still calls down into the same constructor, mybase.new. So it uses the file search zeros constructor to insert values into those fields that describe the behavior of the class, and it overrides the search procedure. Now, unfortunately, we had to override the entire search procedure because that's the granularity of procedures we had. If someone had extracted out just the little bit we need to override, we could have overridden that, but they didn't. So we have to override the entire procedure. Here we've added here for each file in local files. This time we'll do something slightly different. The boss said, you know what? I don't need just the name. I need the name and the size. Can you make me another version of that class so I can do that in some reports, but use the original one in some applications? What a pain. I'm getting angry at my boss at this point. Anyway, if we run this version, this is C, you'll see we're creating an instance of the file search 1A class and executing it. We execute it, we get a list of files and their sizes. So, so far, we've created three versions of the same behavior with slightly different results. The first one just returned a list. The second one iterated through the files it finds and displays their names in the console window. The third one iterates through the files and displays name and size in the console window. And it seems like we've done a lot of work. We keep copying and pasting and overwriting a lot of effort just to change one little tiny feature of this class. There's got to be a better way. One alternative that developers used before .NET was to create an event interface, which I'll call iFileFoundHandler. We normally start interfaces with an i that provides a method to handle the files, which I'll call DisplayFile, and perhaps other methods as well. You might have an interface with multiple methods, I don't know you need to provide a class that implements this interface. You'll need to modify the file search class to add a property of this type and have the search method call the display file method of the handler property. You know that that property provides a display file method because that variable implements the iFileFoundHandler interface which forces the class to provide a display file method. Let's investigate an example of this. This is the iFileFoundHandler interface. You can even see it says public interface iFileFoundHandler. We have the declaration for procedures this interface requires. There's a display file method which takes in a file info and although the interface doesn't describe what to do with the file, your class that implements this interface will include code to do something with the file. There's also another sub named other proc you don't care about just to demonstrate that interfaces might have more than one procedure in them and when you implement an interface you have to implement all the procedures even ones you don't need 
That's the interface. Let's go back to File Search 2, which includes a variable of that type. OK, so here we have public handler as ifile found handler. So we've got this variable. It's public. It's of the type of that interface. Before we can use this code, someone's going to have to supply a value for that variable, the caller. But because handler implements ifile found handler, we know it has a display file method. So therefore, down in our code down here, once we get our array of files, we can say if handler is not nothing, if it's something at all, then for each file in the collection of files, we're going to call the display file method of that handler. Handler implements ifile found handler. So we know it has a display file method. We're not sure what it's going to do with that display file, but that's the beauty of this. We don't care. All we know is for every file, we're going to call that display file method. OK, seems good to me. Let's look at the code that uses this. This is D, event interface 1. OK, so I'm going to create a new instance of file search 2. I'm going to set the handler property to be a new instance of the display file name class. Let's go find that. Display file name is here. It implements ifile found handler. So it has to have a display file method that accepts a file info object that implements the display file method. And it's got another proc named other proc you don't care about that implements the other proc you don't care about method. You have to implement it whether you want to or not. It's part of the interface. Well, what does our display file method do? It just writes to the console window, display file, and the name of the file. OK. So what do we do? We go back to our code, which is here. There we go. And we call the execute method of our file search class. Now, what's it going to do? It's going to find the files, and for each file it found, it's going to call the display file method of the handler property it's been set. Let's run it full speed. And you can see that it did call that procedure. It called the display file method of the handler variable it was passed. Since the handler is a new instance of the display file name class, and the display file name class implements ifile found handler and provides a display file method, we're sure we can call it from that search method. Here we are. So we ended up with a list of files by calling that method in the class we were passed. But what if we were passed some other class, option D? If we'd pass not a new instance of display file name, but an instance of some other class, it might have done something totally different. Here we have an example. Here in the next example, let's just try this, we have a second version. In this example, we're still using File Search 2, but in this case, we're passing an instance of a different class, Debug File and Size. Here we are. Debug file and size implements ifile found handler. The display file method has to be there, and this time it writes into the debug window the file name and the size. We still have to implement that other procedure we don't care about because we're implementing an interface. All right, let's try this. Where's our code? There it is. Let's step on. Create the class. Here's our constructor. I'm stepping over now. We create the new instance of the debug file and size class and pass it to the handler property of our searcher. We call the execute method, which does the work, and this writes output to the output window. Let's go look at it. If I bring up the output window here, there's our list of files and their sizes. This class handled the output differently. It wrote stuff to the output window instead of writing it to the console window. So by specifying a different class, we got different behavior. That's really kind of neat that you can pass in a reference to a different class instance and get different behavior from your file searching. It's easy to add multiple handlers. That is, to have multiple things happen when the search class finds a file. These are often called listeners. 
and we can add multiple listeners. File search three adds a generic list to handle listeners. You can call a method, which I normally call advise and unadvise, to add or remove items to or from that list of listeners. It's like signing up for a mailing list. If you sign up, they'll send you an email letter. If you want to unsign up, they'll stop sending you that junk mail. So the advise and unadvise methods are like signing up for a newsletter and then removing yourself from the list later on. You only get the newsletter if you sign up. You'll only get notified about a file being found if you add yourself to the list of listeners. When a file is found, the search class loops through the list for each file that it finds. Now this allows you to control which listeners you call in which order. Because they're called in the order, they're added to the list. Let's try an example that shows off using multiple handlers. Let's look at the File Search 3 class, which adds this functionality. We have a public variable named Handlers, which has a list of iFile found handler in it. Okay, that Handlers is a list of objects that should be called every time a file is found. Down here in the search procedure, for each file that we find, for each handler as iFile found handler in the list of handlers, if the handler isn't nothing, then call its display file method, passing in the file that was just found. In our example, we're going to have two handlers. We're going to add two handlers to the list. We have an advise method and an unadvise method. This method allows you to tell the File Search 3 class that an object wants to be notified when a file is found. The unadvised method allows you to tell the File Search 3 class that you want to remove a handler from the list so it will no longer be notified if files are found. Okay, that's all we added. The handler collection, the advised and unadvised method, and the loop down here every time we find a file so that we call every handler in the list. Let's try the code. I'll try F, multiple listeners. We step in here, and I'll create a new instance of each of my two iFile found handler classes, the ones we've already seen. Handler 1, Handler 2. One of them writes to the console window, one of them writes to the debug window. I'll create an instance of File Search 3 and call the advise method. So the File Search 3 class adds the handler to its list of handlers. Here's the code. It calls the add method to add the handler we passed in to the handler's collection that it's keeping track of. That's it. It's time to execute. When we call the execute method, the file search class will search through all the files. For each one it finds that matches, it will call each of the objects in its list of handlers and call its display file method. So we should end up with data in two places. I'll step over that. Now, although it isn't necessary, because FS3 is going away real soon now, it doesn't hurt to unadvise. And if you were going to call the execute method again and you wanted different behavior, you probably would want to unadvise and remove these items from the list of handlers. Just showing you how you could do it, and now there are no more handlers to be called if a file was found.